Welcome to TV, Tennessee Valley Church. Today we continue our conversation about biblical faith and natural sciences. And today we focus on creation. Alfred Lord Whitehead, a British academic, wrote an article titled Religion and Science in 1925. Whitehead noted, When we consider what religion is for humankind and what science is, it is no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision of this generation as to the relations between them, between science and religion. Whitehead said that 99 years ago, and the conversation is equally critical today. That's why I'm talking last week and this week about biblical faith and natural sciences. This week we're talking about the differences and the commonalities of the biblical view and the scientific view of creation. Let's begin with this. We all should be humble. Neither people of biblical faith nor people of science, nor people who hold to both, have it all figured out. We will never in our lifetimes or our descendants' lifetimes know all there is to know about this vast and complex universe of ours. The best scientific thinkers among us will be proven wrong at some point in history about something that they presently believe to be fact. They just don't know what it is that they're wrong about. Science is a never-ending quest for understanding. Likewise, until Jesus returns, people will be wrestling with the truths they read in the Bible, trying to harmonize and understand those things that baffle us about the ways of God. God's Word doesn't change, but we grow in our understanding of that Word. Therefore, since all of us are in over our heads, we all should be humble, including in our conversations about creation, how it all began. We should remember that we can hold our science books and our Bibles in our hands at the same time. On the first page of his book, Believing is Seeing, Dr. Michael Gillen, Harvard professor, science editor for ABC News and History Channel host, said the following, As a physicist, mathematician, astronomer, and Christian, I have a worldview broad enough to accommodate both the scientific method and the Bible, reason and faith, the universe and God. Science is not the enemy of God. Instead, it is God's gift to humanity, a brilliant way to explore His transfinite nature and stunning creation. There's a great analogy by the late John Polkinghorne, a British physicist and Anglican priest. He said, let's imagine you come to my house and see a pot of water boiling on the stove. You ask, why is that water boiling? Well, I could answer, the water is boiling because the stove heated the water to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, thus increasing the energy of the water molecules so that they are moving so quickly they're transforming into gas. Or, I could answer, the water is boiling because I wanted some tea. Which answer is correct? Both, of course. You get the point. The Bible and science take different approaches to answering questions about creation. And I believe if we had the capacity to fully understand them both, we would say, they're both right. Science does not prove God, of course, but it points to a creator. This is what I mean. There is something, and something doesn't come from nothing. Something from nothing is just not logical. Folks my age remember Billy Preston's song, nothing from nothing leaves nothing, but you got to have something if you want to be with me. Now I can't say that I've dug into the profound meaning of that song, but I understand the words, you got to have something. Something from nothing is just not logical. Forgive my lengthy quotes here, but I want you to hear from folks who know infinitely more than I do about this topic. Dr. Noby Stone is a fairly new friend of mine who's a devoted Christian and a disciplined scientist. He lives here in Huntsville. Dr. Stone put it like this. Since the universe incorporates everything physical that exists, all matter, energy, time, space, biological life, if it had a beginning, then it follows that there was nothing physical 
before the beginning. So, Dr. Stone says, we've got to answer the question, how did something come from nothing? Back to Dr. Stone. If in the beginning the universe created itself, then it would have had to create itself from nothing. Moreover, it would have had to begin its creation before it existed. And that's impossible, Dr. Stone says. So he contends that before there was a universe, there had to be an intelligent designer, a creator, who is, in his words, outside of the physical universe and its laws. Dr. Werner von Braun said simply, from nothing, nothing can come. There simply cannot be a creation without some kind of creator. I like the way climate scientist John Christie put it in an email to me. I think the most critical question of physics and cosmology is simply, why is there stuff? There's no physical explanation for the fundamental existence of even the tiniest subparticle or photon. We know a tremendous volume of information about matter and energy and their interplay and transformations into other types of matter and energy. But there's no substantive theory that explains their origin. Even Stephen Hawking struggled scientifically with this very question all his life. So, Genesis 1-1 starts out with the answer to the biggest scientific question of all time. One of the reasons Genesis is my favorite book, he said, a home run on the first pitch. Why should we believe there's a creator? Simply put, because there is stuff. Two, not only is there something, this something is orderly. The fact that there is structure, not chaos, points to an intelligent designer. Von Braun again. The more we learn about God's creation, the more I'm impressed with the orderliness and unerring perfection of the natural laws that govern it. In this perfection, man, the scientist, catches a glimpse of the Creator and His design for nature. The order, laws, rationality, and predictability of our universe, all that doesn't prove God, but it sure makes it hard to argue against a grand orderer. So, how should we read Genesis 1 through 3? Let me offer an observation. All divine revelation is accommodation. God accommodates us when He reveals truth to us. He adapts the way He reveals Himself so that we can understand great truths. He lowers Himself to our level to the point that we can comprehend. He uses language and images that are on our level. Like one of you rocket scientists would explain aeronautical engineering to your preschool child. God accommodates us. That is nowhere more evident than in the biblical account of creation. God stooped to the elementary level of human understanding to narrate the beginnings of our world. Genesis was written about 3,500 years ago. The language and images of Genesis 1 to 3 were intended for that audience, an audience with little understanding of cosmology, the science of the origins of the universe. In Genesis, God stooped to our level in an act of divine condescension to narrate the story of creation. Any account of creation that would rise to our level of scientific understanding would have seemed like gibberish to the original readers and hearers of the first book of the Bible. In order to make the story of creation relevant for all people of all times and places, God inspired the writer of Genesis to employ imagery that communicates no matter in what era or what culture people have lived. And since Genesis 1 to 3 is God's accommodation, we don't have to read Genesis 1 to 3 literally to read it seriously, to be clear. There were two historical figures, I believe, Adam and Eve. The references to the sin of Adam and Eve in Romans 5 are references to real people, not just symbolic representatives of humankind. However, there are a lot of figurative, poetic phrases, lots of accommodation in the beginning chapters of Genesis. There are, for example, lots of anthropomorphisms, images that describe God in human terms. Here's what I mean. Genesis 2.2 says that on the seventh day, God rested from all His work. Did God actually 
rest. In Isaiah 40, 28, we read, The Creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. So rest in Genesis 2 is a poetic way of saying God simply ceased that particular activity of creation. And I don't think we're supposed to read it literally when the Bible says in Genesis 3, 8 that Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God as He was walking in the garden. God is spirit, according to John 4, 4, and He would not make a noise when He shows up. When the Bible says they heard God walking in the garden, that's a figurative, poetic image. The first three chapters of Genesis are majestic, dramatic depictions of the breathtaking work of our Father and Creator. And that's true whatever one's level of scientific expertise. We can read Genesis 1 to 3 seriously without reading it literally. We do that with other texts, don't we? Take Psalm 139, verse 13. You knit me together in my mother's womb. We believe that speaks truth, but not literal truth. We don't believe God climbed with His knitting needles into the mother's body. We believe that, that, to, we believe that to be a poetic description of a biological reality. To speak of the biological facts of conception in the psalmist's day would have seemed nonsensical to the hearers. But, you knit me together in my mother's womb, that speaks to all people, no matter their understanding of reproductive biology. Likewise, Genesis 1-3 to is a poetic description of biological reality. It is divine accommodation. Any modern scientific account of creation that would make sense to us would not have made sense to the original hearers and readers of the first book of the Bible. In order to make the story of creation relevant for all people in all times and places, God inspired imagery that, that communicates to seekers of truth no matter their era, place, or culture. So, for example, we don't have to believe planet Earth is only 6,000 years old, as some contend. We don't have to believe that. The Bible doesn't insist on that. Furthermore, we don't have to dismiss the idea that God's method of creation was evolution. We don't have to dismiss it. We can engage with it, wrestle with it, with open minds. Now, I can't speak for or against evolution personally. I don't understand it well enough. But listen to this by Alistair McGrath, a wonderful Irish theologian. The notion of create need not be interpreted as a single once-for-all event, but can equally, and many would now say rightly, be understood as a directed process. This is the view of creation that was set out by Augustine of Hippo, who spoke of God creating a world with an inbuilt capacity to develop and evolve. A similar point was made by the English churchman Charles Kingley in 1871. We knew of old that God was so wise He could make all things, but behold, He is so much wiser than even that, that He can make all things make themselves. Wow, this is heavy stuff. Let's take a break for an interview in music. I'll be back in a few minutes with what I think this all boils down to.
Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Noby Stone. Uh, he is retired from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, where he served as the chief scientist for two space shuttle missions and principal investigator or co-investigator for science experiments on eight additional space missions. Uh, he has done research and is internationally acclaimed, uh, but what he really wanted me to make sure that I let you know was that he has six grandchildren whom he loves dearly. So uh, I'm so thrilled to speak with you today uh, and to let you share your expertise with our TV audience today. So uh, my first question for you, you are both a scientist and a person of faith. So do you ever find biblical faith and science to be in conflict? Not, um, <clears throat> not directly, but uh, sometimes there is conflict as a result of our understanding mm. on both sides, science and scripture. So I, I believe that there is room for improved understanding, both in scripture and in science. What would you say um, to people of faith who feel like science is a threat or a com competitor to religion? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, they should not consider science a threat. Um, God, after all, is the almighty creator of, of the universe. Science is the study of the creation to understand its nature and its operation. So they should not be in conflict any more than um, science, which is a study of God's creation, any more than uh, theology, which is a study of God's revelation through His Word. So, so they should not be in conflict. Um, in fact, Paul tells us in Romans 1.20 to look at the creation and see the nature of God. Yeah, that's a beautiful verse. So what would you say to scientists who dismiss belief in God because they say that it's, it's not verifiable scientifically? Well, I have faced this question sure. numerous times, you might guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I will make three points here. The first is that um, the purpose of the Bible is the redemption of mankind. It's not intended to explain nature to us. So it's not a book of science. However, what it does claim is that it is the writings, true of an ancient pre-scientific people, but inspired by the almighty creator of all nature. So that being the case, kind of use a scientific technique here when you can't study something directly, you think about, well, how might this have occurred? And if it occurred this way, what do we expect? So if the Creator is the inspiration for the Bible, what would we expect to see? And what we would expect to see is uh, a supernatural intelligence in the, in the inspiration that would occasionally surface or shine through the redemptive message. A colleague of mine, uh, he was an Israeli, and he was an atheist. And he came down here to, to work with me. And the first time we met, he said, why, how can a person like you believe all that stuff? Well, you know, the last command our Lord gave was to go and teach. It must have been important because it's the last thing he gave. So, so I explained. And over the years... Um, my colleague came to understand that Christian faith is not baseless. In fact, he, he came to uh, uh, respect the Christian religion. And one day he came and he said to me, he said, um, yes, there is a lot of, of basis for believing in God. And I understand that it's a choice. And I choose not to believe. Why? Why did my friend choose to make that decision? Well, it turns out his mother had been 
incarcerated in one of the death camps by the Nazis during World War II. She um, survived physically, but because of what they had done to her, she lost her mind. And he simply could not accept a God that would allow such a thing to happen. So my friend was a very highly respected scientist. His profession required uh, logical, data-based conclusions. And yet when it came to the most important decision of his life, he based it on emotions. So the point is that, uh, believe it or not, scientists are human. And they, just like everybody else, they're subject to emotions. And just like everybody else, they often don't analyze things logically. So my advice is, don't be intimidated by science. Be intimidated by God. And be awed by the fact that the Almighty Creator loves you and wants you to love Him. Truer words never spoken. Thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate me. it. Today we're talking about biblical faith and natural sciences with a concentration on creation. Frankly, I've struggled with today's message. I was more at home in an English class than in a science class. I've stretched to understand the scientific language surrounding creation. The best conclusion I can imagine to a conversation about biblical faith and science with a focus on creation is worship. Awestruck and dumbstruck, fascinated and flabbergasted worship. Isaiah 40, 26 says, Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Tom Carney, in his book, The Way It Was, told the following story. In the mid-1800s, there lived a man in Huntsville, a slave who belonged like property to a man named Macklemore. The slave's name was not recorded. The slave never traveled far from the home where he was born and had no formal education. But the slave was a mathematical genius. People marveled at how quickly he could add, subtract, and multiply enormous figures. They'd throw math problems at him and would thrill at his skill. Professors from Nashville heard about him and came down to study him. They tried to stump him with big math problems, but couldn't. And then, when they were almost through, one of the Nashville professors asked him, How many stars are in the universe? Surprisingly, the slave jumped up and ran out of the room. The professors thought they'd stumped him. And when they found him outside, they said, Ha! You don't know the answer. The slave answered, though, there just ain't no word for a number that big. The number of stars in individual galaxies, the number of galaxies, the distance of the galaxies, and how long it takes light to travel from there to here. For a guy like me, there just ain't no word for a number that big. Makes me want to sing. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou
Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Tim Boone, Minister of Missions at First Baptist Huntsville. To be a follower of Jesus means that you're on mission. God calls all of us to join our hearts with God's heart for the world. I hope that you'll join us as we seek to be the church in the heart of the city, with a heart for the region and for the world. You can visit the missions page on our website to find different ways to serve right where you are, or you can join us as we travel outside of our city and throughout our world. You can also email me at tim at fbchsv.org. I'd love to hear from you.